Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here at the Rock Island Auction House today, taking a look at some of the guns in their September of 2015 premiere auction. Now, I'm down on the production floor today, taking a look at this behemoth, because this thing's too big to carry up the stairs. This is sort of a Hotchkiss revolving cannon. So, historically, uh, the Hotchkiss revolving cannon was kind of a competitor to the Gatling and Gardner and Nordenfeld guns. This is the era of the mechanically operated machine gun. So Benjamin Hotchkiss, who is an American gun designer who had set up operations in France, because frankly the Europeans were much better customers than the Americans, <coughs> in the early uh, 1870s, after the Franco-Prussian War, he came up with the idea for this gun um, as a much better option than the French mitrailleuse that had utterly failed to be a revolutionary weapon in the Franco-Prussian War. Now, this looks very much like a Gatling gun. Five barrels, it's a rotary cannon, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a bunch of significant differences. The first one is Hotchkiss decided to start his guns at 37 millimeter. Most of the Gatling guns were rifle caliber, and they would get up to maybe a one, or at most a two inch bore. These guys started at 37 millimeter. Now, the reason for that was international convention prohibited the use of explosives on projectiles smaller than that. And Hotchkiss figured you kind of wanted explosive projectiles to make this thing particularly effective. So they were ultimately manufactured mostly in 37, but then also a bunch in 47 millimeter and a small number in 53 millimeter. Uh, they were actually tested out by the US military in 1876 and 77. The test went extremely well. Um, there were a couple malfunctions of the gun. Um, the first few were actually determined to be a, a faulty firing pin. They fixed that and the gun was basically flawless from there out. Um, quite remarkable, really, for a, a gun of its complexity and size. It was uh, purchased by the U.S. Navy. Um, that's where these were primarily used, was as naval guns, uh, to protect ships from small boats. Uh, they did also see infantry use. In fact, you'll see pictures of these guns actually in use in the First World War, as both anti-personnel and anti-aircraft guns. Um, they were also very popular worldwide. They were purchased by a huge variety of countries, everyone from Chile to Russia. Now, this particular gun is not actually a Hotchkiss revolving cannon. This is a modern reproduction of one, and it has been scaled down to 50 caliber. It's kind of a weird 50 caliber. Um, th this isn't a one-off. Um, a number of these were made, although I don't know who made them. Uh, but I've seen a couple different ones out there, and they're all obviously of the same pattern. Um, it uses 50 Browning machine gun, 50 BMG brass, but only smokeless or only black powder loads. So this general design isn't capable of withstanding a modern smokeless cartridge. So the guys who manufactured these reproductions figured, you know, a 50 BMG is the right size to make a cool reproduction like this that's big enough to be impressive but small enough to actually be practical to shoot. But of course we can't run modern smokeless ammo, so what you have to do to run to shoot one of these guns is hand load black powder 50 caliber. Maybe sounds like a pain, but really a pretty good solution, I think, for what they were trying to get. Now, this is a hand-cranked gun, and as you fire it, the barrels turn. What makes this distinct from a Gatling is that it only has one bolt, and one of the features that uh, military uh, ordnance boards at the time really liked was that when the gun is actually firing, the barrels are stationary. So you turn the crank continuously, but there is uh, a dead period in there where the barrels are at rest. That's important for accuracy. If the, if the barrel is actually moving while it fires, nah, that's, that's not so great for accuracy. So why don't I bring the camera back here? Let's take a look in the back end of this gun and check out the mechanism because it's pretty cool and it's totally different from a Gatling. All right, so the mechanism is pretty much all accessible inside this rear cover plate. What I'm gonna do is take this rear cap pin, unthread it, comes up high enough and then our cover plate drops down and we have all the guts inside. All right, so looking inside the mechanism, the most obvious thing is this big camming wheel. Now there are five studs. There's one, there's one up there. My laser is gonna kind of refract around inside, but we've got a, a stud right there. We've got one right there, one right over here. 
those are connected to the barrels. So that cam and those studs are what cause the barrel cluster to rotate when you turn the crank handle. We then also have this guy right here. That's the firing pin mechanism. There is, it's again on a cam, and as you turn the, the crank handle, it will pull the firing pin back and then release it to snap forward. Um, this fires one round per full revolution of the handle. Then lastly, we have this assembly over here. That is the cartridge rammer and extractor, both functioning simultaneously. So this gun fires, it has an operation being done, not quite at every barrel, but each operation occurs at a different position as you're turning the crank handle. So in this position, it rams the cartridge in, in this position it fires it, and in this position it extracts and drops it out of the gun. So let me go ahead and turn the crank handle so you can see some of this in action. So you can see this guy reciprocating. This is the rammer. And then opposite to it is the extractor. Back here, right there, you can see the firing pin coming up and snapping down. And of course, you can see this cam interacting with those five studs to rotate the barrel. Let me show you the same thing from the front with the barrels rotating. You can see, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm turning the crank continuously and the barrel cluster rotates intermittent. So it stops, 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 etc. And that ensures a more accurate fire. So the gun is loading on this barrel, it's firing down on this barrel, and it's extracting down here. Let me show you the rammer operation up on top here. So the original Hotchkiss guns were fed by clips, basically, sort of gravity-fed magazine. They're, they're more boxes to contain cartridges that happen to fit into the gun. On this reproduction, they have built sort of a, a guide chamber here that you can stack about five cartridges in. So you'd put them in here, and then as you fire, rotate the handle back and forth, this ramrod takes the, the bottom cartridge in the stack and pushes it forward into one of the barrels. And you can see, each time I rotate the handle and a new barrel comes into position, this rammer pushes a cartridge into it. So the gun ejects underneath, right down here. Unfortunately, the lights, I can't get a good shot up in there. Basically, it's simply the brass case is open underneath the gun, and there's a little extractor claw that pulls each cartridge out <laughs> as you cycle through. All right, a few other controls I want to point out. Elevation for this gun is adjusted here with this screw. It allows you to raise and lower the entire gun. Um, this thing weighs about 300 pounds, so elevation screws like this are a very good thing. Of course, the original guns being significantly huger weighed a whole lot more. They did have a variety of different mountings. This one is set up like you would have for an early Gatling gun um, or an infantry gun. Uh, many of these, the original actual Hotchkiss guns were used in a naval application, and so they'll have a pedestal mount that would bolt to the deck of a ship. Um, they did also have wheeled carriages like this one, though. Uh, this side handle is precision windage adjustment. You don't have any gross windage adjustment on this. If you want to move the windage significantly, what you do is grab the bottom of the carriage and pivot the entire gun carriage. This gives you a few degrees of adjustment for precisely adjusting your fire. And lastly, we have our iron sights, which are mounted offset on the right side of the gun. There's a little tensioning screw down here. That allows me to adjust this rear sight out to whatever elevation I would like. Well, thanks for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed the video. You know, it'd be really cool to have one of these. I know a guy who has one of these exact guns sitting in his living room, and it's a pretty awesome ornament, and a shootable ornament, too. If you'd like to have this one yourself, take a look at the link in the text description below. That'll take you to Rock Island's catalog page on the gun where you can see their pictures and their description. And then you can create an account online and place a bid or come down here to Rock Island in person to participate in the auction. Thanks for watching.